Before the discovery of oil, there was the golden age of agriculture. Cotton, rice, groundnut, cocoa, timber, and oil palm were in abundance through harvesting. Each region in the country grew a crop or practiced a craft that served as a foreign exchange earner. The original federalism in practice at the time allowed each region to control their politics and economy, making each economically independent and inward-looking for survival. By the time oil was discovered in 1958, Nigeria's political and economic structure had begun to change. Every region was able to take care of itself, have strong institutions, have good political structures. Um, everybody was independent of the, the, the government at the center was not the all-powerful like what we have now. So if you look at that, and that's why we keep saying that there's no state, now that we look at states, or there's no region in Nigeria that cannot fear for itself if we decide to think inwardly. But the challenge was that immediately we saw oil, every other thing became secondary. We marched towards oil. The oil boom brought economic prosperity to Nigeria from the 1950s and positioned her further as the giant of Africa. But the newfound wealth turned the country to a mono economy and caused an abandonment of other revenue streams like her agricultural produce. The oil was a plus, it's not a minus. And um, that was supposed to actually uh, make the economy to grow even faster because it was an addition if we were able to sustain the agricultural production that we had. Um, but I think that there was a decline in that area and that means that a lot of emphasis was placed on the oil that was discovered. It was an easier way of um, making money for the government and the states. So um, the agricultural uh, economy was abandoned, basically. Diversified Economy Nigeria became Mono Economy Nigeria, and fiscal federalism became pseudo-federalism. Economic analyst Mukta Mohammed says the bridge between both points was the quality of Nigerian leadership. Then we talk about Bofemi Owala, we talk about Tafa Balewa, Madu Bello, Michael Okbaranko. They could talk about any economic issues compared to now that um, we, they, they don't seem to have an idea, rather the technocrats sell the idea to them. They don't have any depth in terms of economic value. As Nigeria clock 60, Chris Undulue looks back to measure the country's economic status in comparison with other oil-producing countries. So you cannot score Nigeria very high in, in so many areas, in almost all, um, all indices. If you look at where Nigeria was in 1960 when it got independence, you look at where Nigeria was in the 70s, 10 years, 15 years after independence. At that time, yes, we were the giant of Africa, and everybody was looking up to Nigeria to be the leading light, to provide that economic emancipation of the African continent. But that hasn't happened. Looking ahead, Undolue and Mukta make these key suggestions for the economic growth of Nigeria. Let's begin go back to education. Let's see how we can come up with that. Not the 6334. We had we used to have the technical school, so not everybody will say I have I don't have knowledge to go to school, but I can I can, I can still make chairs, I can still be a carpenter, I can still be a trader. Those are the type of things that we need to begin to see. Look at our people, not just pushing the foreign education to them. Foreign education is good, but what is education? I think education is for people to read and write. Once they can read and write, can they look at what they can do better? We need to give the, the states more autonomy in terms of economic issues. Economic freedom for the states is important because the states can now decide to look at the human resources they have and decide on how to channel their energies into productive things. Nigeria is the largest producer of oil in Africa, endowed with other natural resources and over 200 million strong population. Yet, 40% of her people, or 82 million Nigerians, live below the poverty line. Analysts say the way out is economic diversification and a return to fiscal federalism, like the days before the discovery of oil. Aneta Felix, PLOS TV Africa.
Thank you for still staying with us on this day where we are celebrating Nigeria at 60 and we still continue the special broadcast for Independence Day. This segment will be taking a look at our economy and how Nigeria has fared in it and to make sense of it and help us uh, dissect it and look critically on the issues affecting our economy, we have Okpeyemi Agbaje who is a policy analyst. Good to have you, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning and happy independence. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. I'm, I'm sure you saw uh, the reports that we played. Uh, very quickly, my first question would be for you. 60 years after, how do you rate our economy? I, I think there's no doubt if you, if you look at the quality of life of the average Nigerian if you look at the indices around human development, infrastructure, um, if you look at the current state of the Nigerian economy, as we speak, if you look at the fact that for the last five years, so it's not easy to dismiss our current economic condition as purely the consequence of COVID-19 or whatever. Because for the past five years, the Nigerian economy has either been in recession or has grown at less than 2%. So the, the, the bottom line is that we have, sub, we have, we have underperformed economically um, to, the, to the detriment of our people and uh, to the detriment of the quality of, of the life and the quality of infrastructure that the country should boast of. I, I would say that we could have done very much better. Okay, there, there is a mantra which was also predominant in that report, and that mantra is uh, diversification. And uh, a quick recap of that is that um, we had the cocoa, we had the timber, we had the, pyra the granite pyramid, and uh, virtually all the regions were competing comfortably well, and we were donating to the, to the federal. Is it a problem of structure or a problem of uh, distraction that we now have what we have now? Let, let, me, let me put some context to it. So, so first of all, when we talk about diversification, there are three things that we could be talking about. First, the, the structure of domestic production uh, in terms of GDP. Our GDP is reasonably diversified. We have um, if you look at the last the results we got, agriculture is somewhere around 20% of GDP, trade, um, you have telecoms, you have manufacturing. So the structure of GDP looks like a diversified economy. But the way you get to exports, what do we export to the world? Then you see that we export only one thing, by and large. Yes, there are other things, but one thing accounts for the overwhelming majority, and that is oil. And therefore, the structure of our foreign income, our foreign currency earnings, our, our dollar earnings, our, our reserves, is also then mono product oil. Same thing with government revenue. That's the third area in which we have this problem of this issue of diversification. Government revenue then becomes all wholly concentrated around earnings from oil. And those two issues are why the Nigerian economy suffers from the perils of oil price shocks every time there is a problem with oil. So we have government, our governments rely on oil for 75%, 65 to 75, though and now because of the current conditions. But at a point, they relied on, on oil for 95% of, 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 of our, I mean, for, 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 for government revenue, 75% of government revenue and 95% of exports. That is the problem of the diversification. It's a problem that we created, of course, we know the history. Um, once we, we had oil in economic condition and quantities, um, the Nigerian planners, Nigerian governments began to think differently. We began to, we de facto discontinued that natural transition that, had, that you referred to in your report, in which each of the regions were competitive, each of them focused on areas of comparative advantage. The West focused on cocoa, focused on um, crops that it grew naturally and exported those things. 
began to develop an industrial value chain. So we began to build, we began to build industries around cocoa processing, Cadbury, cocoa processing industries, all of that. The North saw its competitive advantage around cutting, began to invest in textiles. We began to develop a natural sequence of economic development on the basis of competitive advantage. And we were building a value chain from agriculture to industry. The moment we began to get this psyche around, we are now a wealthy country. We don't really have a problem of money. It is how do we deploy it, which was the statement that was true, because in the end, we deployed it badly. But, but, but the point is, then the logic changed. Then we began to build industries that depended on imported raw materials, rather than raw materials that were, that were natural to the environment. And that changed the trajectory of Nigeria's industry. And of course, we then began to build, we developed the big elephant, the white elephant uh, mentality, and began to do big things. Uh, FESTA, uh, National Stadium, things that were not necessarily driven by economic logic. That is the, big, the problem we have. Now we've internalized that consumption pattern. We've internalized it. And now we find it difficult. We've built industries on the structure of imported raw materials, by and large. We've built system of consumption. We've built even governments around that earnings level. We've built a big presidential system of government. Mm -hmm. And like your report correctly mentioned, ongoing with that was a political move away from personalism, mm -hmm. the system of the sharing of, of, of oil events based on a unitary, pseudo-unitary system of government. So we've created both a political and economic structure that does not encourage productivity, that does not look at your natural comparative economic advantages, and that suboptimizes the outcomes for everybody. Mm -hmm. So we haven't done well. Um, we've created a bad structure, economic structure, and we would have to fundamentally rethink and the, the, the structure that both politically and economically. All right, which brings me to my next question for you, Mr. Agbaje. You know, earlier on, you mentioned that the economy has not grown less than 2%, and it's, you know, we can't also blame everything on COVID-19. Essentially, before COVID-19, we've already had issues with our economy. Now, what are those key areas we should begin to look into inwards? You know, when you talk about materials that we have within our own economy that we should now begin to harness. As we do know, oil is no more the thing. So where next? What do we do to still make this economy thriving and growing for, you know, every Nigerian? So first of all, like, we, like we've said, there's the agricultural value chain, building industrialization on the basis of what you produce in agriculture. That we have to restart. But, but then the world has also changed. The global economy has also changed. Mm -hmm. So things are not the way they were in 1960, unfortunately. So now we have to look at technology-driven development as well. We have to begin to focus on how to build the agriculture itself based on mechanization, based on the technology. Our agriculture today is still by and large dependent on one variable, rainfall. If you read every analysis of agriculture put every year, it's based on rainfall. So it's not based significantly on policy intervention wow. or on the deployment of technology. So we have to rebuild agriculture itself, but we also have to build a more modern economy around technology, around, um, around modernizing every aspect of our economy. So for instance, take our real estate sector, which is, a, which is around 8% of Nigeria's GDP. That sector is, up, is, 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 doing, is performing all of that in the absence of a mortgage sector. You have mm. to create a mortgage sector. Mm. If you look at our industrial manufacturing mm. sector, mm. about 10% of the Nigerian economy much of it depended on imported raw materials, as we've said. We have to grow that. We can't abandon the ones that are dependent on imported raw materials, but we have to increase the proportion of industrialization that is based on local raw materials and support them and create the infrastructure around that. A lot of policy has to change. For instance, if you look at infrastructure, it is clear, it is evident that government resources cannot provide the, the, the infrastructure 
that will, I mean, cannot meet over a 50 year period, the resources from government cannot transform Nigeria. Mm. Okay. So the question is how do you get private resources, including foreign import in direct investment into Nigeria's infrastructure? The answer to that question is that you have to create a policy environment that makes infrastructure investment attractive. You have to create a legal um, uh, environment that protects the investor. You have to create a, a framework that investors trust around private, public-private partnership. So there is a whole series of uh, reforms that we would okay. need to, to, uh, to implement Mr. Baggie, to get our economy more Mr. Baggie, so much, so much to talk about, but we want to see how we could manage our time for the next few more minutes that we have. Uh, part of the things highlighted in that report done by Annette Felix, um, a, a mention was made, uh, something was done about whether this oil was a boom or a doom for us, because as we speak, there are a lot of inventions. We have, we have um, the knowledge economy, which seems to be what is thriving now, and we are turning a blind eye to that industry. We are talking about, uh, uh, you mentioned the real estate, we're talking about the ICT that COVID has forced on us, and we see a whole lot happening in that industry. But what we hear, our government is still setting a benchmark on oil, talking about the oil we will get, and it will still be refined outside the shores of this country. Are we ever thinking way forward? I, 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 the oil was a blessing, unfortunately. We didn't have the thinking. And like your reports mentioned, the leadership, the quality of leadership. Imagine if the oil boom had happened and provided resources to Awolowo to further transform the West, or for Kwara to, to further industrialize the East, or for Sir Amadou Bello to further build um, the Northern economy. So it was a, it was an unfortunate combination of excessive resources in the hands of completely inexperienced people. Um, if, if, if the combination had been different, perhaps the outcomes will have been different. But where, where we are today, I think that Nigerian government, is still, as you correctly mentioned, it still has this focus on oil. It's still in denial about the end of the oil era. And um, so every, all the psychology is around oil. Even when we went to the recession, they said oil, oil put us in recession and oil will bring us out. <laughs> it was an opportunity to change our mindset, but we refused to take that opportunity. So why are we today, like I agree with you, we have to build the economy around human capital, around technology, around industrialization, and, and the fundamental errors we've made is that we've destroyed the quality of our people in terms of education, in terms of skill, in terms of competence. We have to go back to that. We have to invest in our people. Our people truly are our greatest assets, the human capital that Nigeria has. The abundance of energy of our youth, the creativity of our people. That's our greatest asset, not oil. And not even the, 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 the infrastructure that we can build, but our people. So we have to build that. If we build that, we will dominate in technology, we will dominate in creative sectors, we will dominate in sports, we will dominate in multiple areas, and, and then we would have the creativity in the business sector to make investments in industry and in and in, in infrastructure that will improve the quality of life of our people. So, so the, the, the mindset change in the public sector around the end of the oil era, and they need to build an alternative economy around people, around infrastructure, and around industrialization, mm. needs to happen. It hasn't happened yet. All right, and if I may just add to what uh, uh, Mr. Ladeinde here had asked you, do we still have a chance to compete in the global economy, in spite of all the issues that you have highlighted and raised, what chance do we have? Actually, if you look at the, the Nigerian people are incredible, and I insist that we are, we, 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 are, we, are, we are the real assets of the people, in spite of all these constraints. If you look at the results that have come from Nigerians, it's disproportionate. Mm. And therefore, it reinforces the fact that we, we are, certainly Nigerians, all hope is not lost. Certainly, Nigeria is not 100% a bad story. There are advantages, there are positives. 
But those positives often have happened in spite of the environment. It has happened because of the resilience of the Nigerians. And Nigerians always have performed, even when they go outside the country. So I'm very optimistic about the outcomes of the Nigerian mission. I think that we, we, are, we have built so much resilience into ourselves, um, the hardships, the constraints, that if we slightly improve the, the environment, if we slightly improve the variables, if we change the policy environment, Nigerians will excel. Okay, let I me do no that. Like we always say, one for the road before you go. Um, you, you mentioned something very, very critical, and that was also highlighted in that report, and that's uh, investing in human capital. Uh, as we speak, I don't know whether you disagree with that popular uh, belief that Nigeria is overpopulated. How do we handle the issue of population in ensuring that? We don't get poorer than we are now. The, the problem with population is that if you invest in it, and if you, if, you, if, you, if you channel it, it becomes an asset. And India's over a billion people, yes, there's still significant poverty. But when their reform started and when their industrialization and their leveraging of technology started, they became an asset all over the world and they dominate science and technology, even in the US. On the other hand, if you don't invest in your people, channel their creativity, they become a liability. And then you have, you have wars and crises, and you have um, the kind of crisis we have. The kind of crisis we have in the Northeast and in the Northwest, and increasingly all over Nigeria, is a problem of non-investment in our youth. And then it transforms into a criminality. And then it transforms into socioeconomic and sometimes political crisis. So I hold the view strongly that our children, our populace, our population may become a liability. It's presently manifesting as a liability. But that's because we have not sufficiently invested in it. We have a policy environment that deliberately does not educate a large population of Nigerian children. How then will it be an asset? So it's the choice that we have to make. It's not too late. We can quickly change our mindset and invest in our people and turn them into the assets that <laughs> Thank you so much, Okpemi Agbaje, a policy analyst, and I must also add a politician because you vied for governorship election in the last uh, dispensation. That's a secret for those who were not following you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, Zamaka, so much, and we have to end this uh, segment. Yes, and uh, let's let's go and celebrate. You yeah. know? There's going to be a parade right. at the Eagle Square, mm -hmm. and uh, we will be part of it. Yes. Anyhow, we can somehow. be part of it yeah, somehow. Virtually, we can always do a exactly. Lot of and uh, it's been quite a revealing moment True. this segment, mm -hmm. and we hope that uh, we are going to have a bigger discussion later in the day by 4 p.m. Then throughout the day, some of this report, we are going to have a longer version being shown on our platform so that people can make a full complement right. of the package. I mean, true. Uh, you have said it all. Uh, for me, what is still standing out for me is the fact that uh, it's a call for reflection. Even as we are 60, there's so much more that uh, has to be done. You know, he said it there that the choices that we make is what is going to determine the way That's forward. True. And I hope we make the right choices. Yeah. So fortunately, we have to say bye now. And uh, on behalf of the production crew, the men behind the camera, and uh, to everyone behind all the buttons, mm -hmm. we want to say thank you to all our reporters, to every member of the management who also put a whole lot to make sure that we have a good outing on the Independence Day. And I must say to you, I think I've not said that, happy Independence. Happy Independence again. Let's, let the celebration now begin. Exactly. <laughs> And that's all for now. We'll be back. And don't also forget, by 10.30, there's going to be a special edition of Tea Time. It promises to be quite revealing. Please don't miss it. And bye for now.